Welcome to Security Token Stories, brought to you by Security Token Academy, the leading educational platform dedicated to covering and facilitating the security token industry. I'm Derek Edward Schloss, Director of Strategy at Security Token Academy. Coming up on today's episode, we have Nick Cowan, CEO and founder of the Gibraltar Stock Exchange Group, a financial services portfolio that includes the Gibraltar Stock Exchange, the Gibraltar Blockchain Exchange, Juno Fund Administration, Fort Advisory, and Hashtags, a fintech subsidiary and developer of the proprietary Stacks blockchain and protocol. The Gibraltar Stock Exchange aims to be one of the world's first regulated stock exchanges to list and trade security tokens. Nick, it's good to have you on Security Token Stories. Before we jump into learning more about Gibraltar Stock Exchange and security tokens, in preparing for this interview, I had a chance to learn a bit more about Gibraltar which is a small British overseas territory bordered by Spain. Why don't we start off by hearing a bit about your personal background and how you got involved with GSX and also a bit more about Gibraltar more broadly. Yeah, sure, Derek. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and, uh, and greetings from, uh, from, from Jib. Um, so my background was a, I was a trader in uh, cash and derivatives. I worked in London uh, and Japan. I um, spent my about 20 years in investment banking. I then became... Uh, the global head of equities, which is quite a big job. It's a classic overpromotion. I did that for five years and then left before I got found out. Uh, I then um, spent time trading my own capital, um, about six, seven years as a, as a um, home trader. And then um, about seven years ago, uh, I was asked to help out this little jurisdiction here um, to see if we could get a stock exchange open here. Um, I said to my wife, I was just popping out to, uh, to do a quick journey and that was um that was seven years ago so um so we we moved here and we started on this journey and in terms of um a couple of things about this little place um as you say it's a british overseas territory so we are we are still for now in the eu uh, obviously that's about to change um and the interesting thing about you know gibraltar is there's a few core pillars of the jurisdiction here about thirty thousand people about 15,000 people walk across from Spain every day to work here. Big, is, uh, big businesses are online gambling. We are, uh, I think, 40% of the global volume. So it's a big business. So in terms of that, I guess, infrastructure and tech, there's been that uh, platform here for about 25 years. Uh, just on that, it was also one of the first jurisdictions in the world to have uh, remote gambling legislation. So that will be relevant when it comes to distributed ledger technology regulations, which I'll talk about in a moment. So the, uh, the jurisdiction has tourism bunkering, which is filling up ships with petrol before they go off and get into trouble with Iran when they go through the Suez Canal, um, and um, tourism and financial services. So financial services is obviously a fast-growing part of um, the jurisdiction. And then if you um, look at our evolution, we opened as a stock exchange in 2014. We were the last country. Uh, in the EU that didn't have an exchange. That was very much our thinking at the time. And we figured that being a gateway to the EU, uh, we could disrupt things in our own, in our own way um, by being faster to market and uh, competitively priced. Uh, and then you know, DLT started to evolve. And we were, um, we were involved as, a, um, as an exchange in structuring the world's, actually the world's first asset-backed security for Bitcoin. This was 2015. So we were, we were, I guess, ahead of our time. Give you an, give you an inkling. The price was $300 at the time. So um, just shows you how quickly things move. Um, and that really took us into the world of, okay, how, how does Bitcoin work? How do you buy and sell Bitcoin? What is a hot wallet? What is a cold wallet? All these things were completely new to, um, to us. And we had to sit down with our regulator and say, look, we want to structure this asset-backed security on Bitcoin. And they asked the same questions. What, what the hell is Bitcoin? That, um, so at least, it was, it, it, at least we went on a journey together. Now, actually, to be fair, around that time, the industry here in Gibraltar and actually industry outside Gibraltar was starting to engage with our government. Um, and obviously, we were involved to a degree because of the Bitcoin thing. And the conversation started, can we regulate this sector in any way? And if we can come up with a regulatory framework, could that serve 
Gibraltar and the clients of Gibraltar in a way that other jurisdictions may not be able to or may take longer to get their, their act together. And to be fair, the government and the minister will say this, their initial reaction was absolutely no interest whatsoever. Um, cryptocurrencies are, you know, that money launderers and, uh, and thieves. And I said, no, no, that's investment banking. Um, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, so, but the, the, reaction of the, regu- the reaction, reaction of the government was very, very negative. And so they set up a working group to make the problem go away. And the working group actually came back and said, we should do this. So actually the minister said, okay, let's, let's be serious. If we're going to do this, how do we do this? So fast forward to January 2018, it became law here. So we have a regulatory framework called the DLT, Distributed Ledger Technology Regs. And we're not trying to regulate Bitcoin because you can't. What you can do is you can say to uh, any client, any body corporate, any company that stores or transmits client assets using the blockchain, well, you can have a set of principles which you have to adhere to in order to be licensed. So if you are in JIB and you use the blockchain for any asset that's not yours, you've got to be licensed. That really puts on the map as a jurisdiction, um, as actually the first in the world. So that was really interesting for us as a, as a stock exchange. We had um, got to the stage where we were thinking, okay, we're, we, we do fixed income and we do funds. Um, what are we going to do about equities? And should we spend money putting in place a um, historic, almost archaic technology solution? Or, this is 2017, or you know what? Can we just go straight to blockchain? And if we go straight to blockchain, what does that mean? How, how do we actually have a, a, a securities exchange, trading securities using DLT? Is it possible? What about the regulatory framework? What about legal? What about KYC? What about AML? What about all these wonderful things? How, how on earth are we going to tackle this? So we, we made the decision that actually, you know what, we are going to do this. We will basically, if you like, leapfrog the traditional world. And we're just going to go straight to DLT, knowing that's going to take us on a bit of a journey. You know, one of the things that's interesting to hear you speak on is the speed at which projects like GSX can really move. Um, due to the unique relationships you're able to have with with legislators and regulators in the area, which can really help these disruptive projects get built quickly. Diving in more to what you've been able to build, in researching the GSX Group, I came across a number of subsidiaries within the GSX Group structure. Maybe we can walk through each of these initiatives and the thesis that underpins how these programs all operate and how they tie back to the GSX Group holistically. Yeah, so if you imagine... If you imagine our group um, as three, I guess, three big verticals. So vertical one is what we would call exchange services. And that includes the Gibraltar Stock Exchange, which is, a, uh, as it says in the tin, an exchange that's uh, licensed under uh, a regulation here called MIFID or MIFID II. Um, so we're a licensed uh, stock exchange. We also have the Gibraltar Blockchain Exchange, which is licensed under those regulations I talked about earlier. Uh, So we have two licensed and regulated exchanges under our exchange division. And I can talk a little bit more, obviously, in detail about that later. Uh, We then have what we would call a financial services division. Um, And I'll talk how they tie together in a moment. The financial services division is, um, it includes Juno, which is um, a fund administration and corporate services company. We're the largest fund administrator here. Uh, But we're also a corporate services company, which means that we are a um, company manager, we can incorporate you. Uh, we can bank you because we have a client account. We can, we're can we a nominee. We're a registrar. And that'll be really, really important to understand what that means later on when we talk about tokenized securities and why, we, why we're on the verge of a pretty cool breakthrough. So Juno is a really important part of our platform, which I'll talk about in a moment as to how they tie together. We've then got Fort. Fort is not in JIB. It's in the UK. Um, it's a licensed broker-dealer. And actually, it's quite good that it's not here. It's an arm's length broker dealer. And that was an acquisition that we made this year. Um, And that's also a really important part of our ability to uh, help our clients with regards to project management, uh, distribution, uh, increasingly execution. Uh, That's really going to be, I think, a a key part of what we have. And then we have another uh, business called Bastion Bay. And Bastion Bay is a is a an algo trading division, and that all forms part of the liquidity side. So 
those three verticals, exchange, financial services, and then technology. Technology is the company called Hashtags. And what Hashtags is, that's the evolution of what I was talking about earlier. So Hashtags is um, our tech co out in Asia. It's actually based in Singapore. Uh, we've got just under 50 blockchain developers in Hashtags. They are, to differing degrees, uh, engaged uh, with probably about 100 financial institutions at the moment. Um, they are 100% arm's length. And um, if you think about the Gibraltar Stock Exchange, they are a client of Hashtags. Now, we are the majority shareholder in Hashtags, but it's very much an arm's length tech co. So you've got those three pillars, tech, FS, and exchange services. So how do they tie together? Okay, so here's an example of a real deal that we're working on right now, which is going to be, we think, pretty groundbreaking news when we when we go public on this in uh, in terms of who the who the uh, uh, participants are. It's a VC fund that's tokenizing its VC. So we think that's going to be quite interesting. What we have done for that client is we have um, advised the client in terms of project management. That's where Fort comes in. Uh, we have helped that client get its fund structured um, in terms of the um, Cayman versus Europe versus um, Delaware, etc. Are we helping that client with his documentation and advice in terms of legals, etc.? Uh, we're then administering that fund through Juno. We're helping with the incorporation of that fund. And then we're helping with the programming of the smart contract. That's basically the hashtags leg. And then we're going to help with the listing of that tokenized fund, the token on GSX. And then we're going to have the, the trading of that token when we get licensed by the FSC, which we're hoping for later this year, early next year. And then we're going to help distribute that token into institutional accounts through Fort. So it's just this awesome um, ecosystem where you know, our clients are increasingly asking us for, a, for a, sort of a, an end-to-end -end solution. And that's effectively what we can do within the GSX group. So there's a real, now if you think about um, taking that token onto the Stacks protocol, we can talk about that a little bit later, but obviously for that, you need to have the smart contract to be able to be programmed, the super nodes to be able to do what the super nodes do, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really, really groundbreaking stuff that, uh, that we think we, you know, we're a very early mover there. And that's the way the group, totally meshes together in terms of its uh, its offering. Yeah, that's great. And really interesting to see your approach in covering all layers of the stack, from advisory to listing to trading, liquidity and market making, and then your technology investments in your proprietary blockchain and protocol that you walked through with stacks. Before we move on, I'd love to hear more about some of the customer-facing benefits you've noticed as compared to other geographic locations where security tokens are starting to take flight. So whether that's regulatory benefits or tax benefits, just any other positives you can speak to for new issuers or traders as a result of GSX's presence in Gibraltar? Yeah, I think, first of all, the, I think it always starts with the jurisdiction, right? So I think what we, what we, you mentioned it earlier, I think what we benefit from here, you know, I worked in London and Japan, and it would be fair to say you don't necessarily have a, an interactive relationship with either government or the regulator in a jurisdiction that's the size of those jurisdictions. Um, when you come to somewhere like Gibraltar, we are two miles long and two thirds of a mile wide. So it gives you an idea of the, and half of that goes up, upwards. So we're pretty condensed into a small neighborhood. And, you know, the government is three floors above me and the regulator is 50 meters behind my desk as I speak to you. So That's amazing. So we, you know, we, we, what that means is that, you know, industry, the regulator, and the government can, can work quite closely together to say, you know, okay, what are we trying to achieve here? What are the objectives of the jurisdiction? How do we do that in a way that protects investors, protects our reputation, but at the same time allows commerciality to, to grow in this sort of, you know, innovative technology field, et cetera. So, as a jurisdiction, we're, we've, we're very lucky that we're able to have a seat at the table and engage in that. And that's really important. So um, when it comes to looking at moving ahead with security tokens, for example, we are able to talk to a regulator who understands um, and not just understands, 
really is a leader in their field in terms of this. And also, we're very much supported by a government who's constantly driving hard um, to uh, to grow the jurisdiction. So I think that's the first, very much the first thing. So having that, um, strategically, it would therefore follow that as a company, you know, you want to try to leverage that and ride that um, good fortune as best as you can, you know. So um, the ability for us as an organization to to try to to lay out our stall as a as a tokenized securities exchange is very much because of the jurisdiction that we're in. Um, you know, as you and I both know, there are other jurisdictions that some are some are ahead, some are a long, long way behind. And uh, it's it's you know it's it's the fortune that we've got to be able to to have that conversation. Now we are part of the EU. We are governed by um, legislation, EU legislation. Um, in terms of securities legislation. And, you know, I often go to conferences where I hear people saying, you know, the, the rules need to change. Well, the, the rules are never going to change, right? So I, I think, or, or they'll take a very long time for European regulators to change regulations. What you have to try to do is to adapt your technology to enable you to adhere to the regulations. Uh, and that's the vital thing, which I think is important. When you look at the way security markets work, and this is just a Let's go down a boring cul-de-sac for a moment, but I'll just give you a, a, a maybe some of your listeners a very simple lesson in the way securities work here. You've got a what normally you have a registered book of members, and that logs the shareholders of a company. Well, normally what happens is they normally have one shareholder, which is the nominee. So the nominee uh, works with the registered book of members, which logs effectively the legal owner the nominee, and then the, the CSD, the Centralized Securities Depository, then actually has the beneficial owners, which are you and me as shareholders. So you have the CSD, the registrar, the nominee, all working together to try to ensure there is a clear record of basically who owns what. So when you transfer a token, let's say from me to you, Derek, what you actually want to do is you want to automatically update the registered book of members to demonstrate the legal and beneficial owner has shifted from Nick Cowan to Derek Schloss. Now, that, that's the key. That's the breakthrough. You've got two types of tokenization. You've got the tokenization of stuff that exists, but then you've actually got the creation of a token that actually is the same as it, it's a security. And a security, when you buy a share on a stock exchange, what you're actually buying is a right to an intangible asset. And therefore, your token has to mirror or mimic that for it to be a true security. And that's where we're, we're working so hard in terms of breaking that. And that's why us being a registrar, as you can imagine, that's where Juno fits because it's a core part of, of that ability for us to be able to, uh, to drive through uh, this change that we see coming in capital markets. So when you talk about why is tokenization important? Why do we think it's really exciting? Um, I can say to you, it's global liquidity. It's going to change the world. I, I, you know, I kind of scratch my head sometimes. If a company's capitalized at $20 million, you know something? It's not going to be very liquid. And it doesn't matter whether you're listed on one exchange or 20 exchanges. Guess what? It's not going to be very liquid. Where tokenization actually really, really, really drives through is efficiency. Because what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to strip away and transform the way assets move and the intermediaries that play a part currently in the cost of moving those assets from one counterparty to the other. And it's just the way security markets have worked for, for decades, if not almost forever. It's just been an electronic ability that's moved securities markets forward. Now, where we are with DLT, we can actually go a step further that when we drive through the directors and the legislative changes and et cetera, that enables us to do what I've just talked about, which is to actually transfer the legal and beneficial ownership that follow with that token, that is going to lead to enormous efficiency. And that's where, you know, when you're, when you're involved with um, a stock exchange like us, if I go into a potential member firm, a broker dealer and say, Tokenized securities, you should list tokenized securities on our exchange and trade them. Um, you know, they'll be like, well, okay, what's a tokenized security? Can you talk me through that? Start from the beginning. 
if you go into a, a, a broker dealer or an investment bank and say, hey, listen, we can save you 80% on your settlement cost, your back office, everything we can help you drive through efficiencies, then, then that becomes exciting. And that doesn't mean there aren't revenue opportunities that, because we're already engaged with a lot of companies on revenue opportunities that, that a blockchain can enable, but it's the efficiency that that tech is going to bring with it. So whether you're talking about stock exchanges or the big investment banks, they're looking at DLT for efficiency. And that's what they're all, you know, a lot of us are going through similar exercises now. But that's where we see the most exciting development over the next few years that's going to transform, hopefully, the cost of capital to the issuer, but also the cost of execution to the investor, which I think is going to be amazing. Yeah, I think framing security tokens as providing, first and foremost, these efficiency gains, it seems to be a really practical way to get people excited who might not be familiar with the technology just quite yet. I want to switch over now to your proprietary blockchain stacks and the stacks token, which is the utility token that aims to drive the ecosystem for the Gibraltar stock exchange. I talked earlier about the evolution of the Stacks blockchain, which is very much us saying, okay, let's, let's develop this with, uh, with securities in mind because we just couldn't, we couldn't find anything out there that, that existed um, that supported our, our, our basically objectives. And we kind of came at it from a couple of ways. We said, okay, the first thing is uh, one of the big challenges is, first of all, there's a, there's a number of different protocols that are currently being worked on out there, um, and we recognize that. So therefore, we have to provide flex into the consensus that allows you know, a choice of consensus algorithm. We think that was uh, pretty important. When you look at regulation, um, you know, we wanted to try to ensure that we could enable through an encrypted algorithm to have KYC on chain, uh, that was really important so that you can have within, for example, our GSX native, uh, KYC is, is obviously vital to enable and to decide on not only knowing your client, but also the eligibility of the client. Um, and we couldn't find any other protocol that, uh, that actually did that, certainly at the time. Obviously, we needed to be fit for purpose in terms of speed um, and um, also to allow you know, languages such as, you know, solidity, et cetera, to be able to be used. So um, we very much came at it from a, okay, if we're going to allow, so you're, you're an issuer, okay, so you want to launch a bond. Okay, so what we tried to do is say, you know what, let's have this as a, as a protocol but with a series of web apps sat on top. So a, an idiot like me, even I can use it. So you go into, and I, we, you know, we could do a demo at a later date, but you go into the Stacks issuance platform, and you basically just say, okay, I want to I launch a bond. I'm going to program my bond to be 100 million, five-year, 4% coupon with the following uh, put option elements, et cetera, whatever it might be. And you can program that smart contract. And within, within 10 minutes, that contract on our platform has been programmed. It's deployed. Now you can enable subscription for investors to go in via their broker dealer, but investors can go in and basically subscribe for that bond. And then the ultimate aim is that those bonds can then be deployed onto the secondary exchange and be traded as tokens with what I talked about earlier being the key aspect, which is the, uh, the transfer of ownership automatically. So the GSX native, which is our, our solution uh, as part of Stacks, so Hashtags has supplied the Gibraltar Stock Exchange. So today, you know, we were the first client because obviously we've been the pilot for the last year and a half. We deployed the tech in uh, Q1. 2019. Uh, we then got licensed by our regulator to, to technically list tokenized debt and funds. Um, and the launch that I hinted at earlier of this VC fund, uh, which will come through hopefully in September, that will demonstrate to the world how uh, the Stacks protocol works um, in terms of being able to facilitate that, that programming and therefore subscription. So that, that's the first thing about the protocol. So it's a private permission chain that is for the stock exchange and our members of our ecosystem, which includes member firms, et cetera. And then within that, we have uh, our Stacks token, which is the utility token of the Stacks protocol. Now, at the moment, that the Stacks token has been 
confined, if you like, to GBX, which was its origin. Um, but the Stacks token uh, utility, which will probably announce in the next two weeks, three weeks, um, which we've told everybody this year, we'll announce it when we launch the protocol in anger. Um, the utility will expand, which is always part of our vision, to expand from just being a, a utility token uh, in a fiat crypto exchange to actually being a utility token that opens up the entire world of tokenized securities. So what we'll have is a uh, delegated proof of stake protocol. The Stacks token does several things. Number one, it gets staked with, this is the envisaged to be the announcement, but let's just assume that this is the final final uh, iteration. But super nodes will stake Stacks tokens in order to be a super node. Super nodes will uh, be primarily regulated institutions who will be a member of effectively the stock exchange ecosystem. And super nodes will be there to ensure that the transaction verification, et cetera, uh, is happening. And the, the non-super node owners of the Stacks token will be able to stake their Stacks tokens with the super nodes and effectively earn rewards that are generated from transaction fees, in brackets, gas fees. Now, those gas fees or transaction fees will be generated in a number of ways. So number one, every time a smart contract is programmed by an issuer with a security being deployed on the Gibraltar Stock Exchange or that smart contract being slightly adjusted or tweaked through the life of that security, that will always incur a Stacks token fee, number one. Two, every time there is a corporate action. Now, what tends to happen with uh, your general uh, protocol tokens such as Bitcoin or your general utility tokens from ICOs, there are no corporate actions. Securities have corporate actions all the time. And that, that can be a dividend. It can be a coupon. It can be a rights issue. It can be a bonus issue. It can be so many different things. You've probably got a hundred different corporate actions. Every time there's a corporate action, there will be a gas fee charged. And we will announce those in the next two, three weeks. A gas fee will be charged or a transaction fee will be charged for corporate actions. Every time a token moves from Nick Cowan's wallet to Derek's wallet, guess what? There is a fee to use the chain, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those gas fees will get collected and they will be uh, allocated to the super nodes. About 70% probably of all transaction fees go to the super nodes. Now, if you imagine as the Gibraltar Stock Exchange grows, and we hope it grows and grows and grows, those transaction fees you know, start to become meaningful because it ties back to the savings that we will enable our members of our ecosystem to achieve by effectively uh, making their back offices all the more efficient. So it's very much a, a high volume ambition, trading securities on our exchange, attracted transaction fees, which will get divvied up and allocated back to the, um, the stacks token holders. So that's the main utility. There are other utility aspects as well. Uh, all of the utility that exists on the Gibraltar blockchain exchange, which is reduced trading fees if you own X many stacks tokens, et cetera, those will all still apply. And we're also, um, we've had approval internally, but we're also going to deploy a number of burning mechanisms as well, which will also, uh, we will use um, to, uh, out of those transactions, those gas fees, we will take a percentage and also burn stacks tokens as well uh, on an ongoing basis. So the stacks token moves from just being a, a crypto token um, in a crypto market to basically being part of the entire stock exchange. But actually, increasingly, if you look at what Juno is doing, Juno is starting to offer discounts on its fund administration business, for example. So if you're a fund administrator, if you're a fund, and you have your fund administered by Juno, you can pay 20 basis points a year for Juno to provide all of that net asset value calculation, et cetera. If you want to reduce your fees, you can pay in Stacks token. So the Stacks token actually has a load of uses across the entire GSX group ecosystem, but primarily it is to drive the transactions on the Stacks protocol within the Gibraltar Stock Exchange. You know, it sounds like the Stacks network token has some interesting use cases. It's a medium of exchange for the ecosystem. It'll be used for staking, for reducing trading fees, 
potential discounts, listing rights, membership rights. It's really fascinating to hear how you're thinking about this network token really incentivizing and potentially powering the Gibraltar Stock Exchange. I also find this approach really interesting because you know there seemed to be this abrupt pause in 2018 with the network token model. That being said, your team is being very thoughtful about bridging these two worlds together, the native network token and the security tokens that will trade at GSX. It's a glimpse at how these incentive mechanisms can parallel these regulated security tokens if done thoughtfully. I think it's interesting, Derek, because I think, you know, look, the, and you're absolutely right. 2018 was a tough year for um, for utility tokens generally. And look, we, we within GBX, uh, we've, we announced the change from, originally it was called the ROC token, and we, we announced the change to Stax token. And we were very, we were very keen to try to do the right thing by our original backers. And I think there's a couple of things to say. I think number one, we, we were really um, incentivized to increase the utility as much as we could um, to try to um, drive the value of the token. I think that's, you know, that's important because people backed us. And I'll be honest, the token has not performed well. You know, Ether was down, it's down 70% from where we fixed it at our ICO, but our token has um, done worse than that. And I think part of that is the, the bear market. And I think secondly, because we haven't yet rolled out the Stacks um, protocol uh, and that's coming. So I think that's number one. So we were very, very keen to, uh, to try to do the right thing and widen utility to get the use up. Secondly, we were really, which we haven't done to date, we were really keen in terms of burning um, and we're going to implement that as well. And thirdly, um, we are trying to look at a really innovative way, but this is subject to legal and regulatory sign-off for us also to provide an additional edge to our Stax token holders. Uh, we've been engaged quietly with um, some members of our community and some of our big Stax token holders also, where perhaps we could try to tie the um, interests of our Stax token holders to also the performance of our group as a whole. And if we can do that, then, you know, I think we've, we've done everything that we can do to, um, to try to create value for our tax token holders because, you know, they are very, very important to us because they are, they are the guys who without, we wouldn't be here today. So, you know, we are, we are trying to do the right thing. You know, switching over to some recent news, Bitbond, which is a peer-to-peer lending platform, they ran a regulated STO a few months back successfully ended up being Germany's first EU-regulated STO. Now, their BB1 security token is trading live. It allows investors to participate in the success of the loans that are being brokered by Bitbond. And I noticed that GSX had entered into a new collaboration with Bitbond. I'd love to hear about a few of those details about that partnership, why it's compelling for GSX. And then as an extension of this, as you continue to build out the GSX infrastructure, you know, what you're expecting by way of segmentation and makeup for both your listers and your investors that might come over to GSX in the future to uh, list and trade security tokens? Yeah, so I think in answer to the first question, we have been watching the Bitbon guys. For those of you that aren't in Europe, we have a probably a, a common view that the German regulator BaFin is probably one of the one of the most conservative regulators that are out there. They're, you know, they're, 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 they're tough. All regulators are tough, but BaFin in particular are very conservative. So when, um, if you think about um, European legislation, we have something called the prospectus directive. So what that means is if you're going to do an offer to the public, uh, you, um, so for example, if you want to list on our main exchange, we have two exchanges here uh, within GSX. We have the main market and the global market. The main market, if you want to list on the main market, um, in simple terms, um, that is deemed to be an offer to the public. And if you're going to do an offer to the public, you have to have your offering document approved by the regulator. So to do a tokenized offering to the public, that's kind of a big deal because the way it works over here is if my regulator in Gibraltar approves a prospectus of an issuer that wants to join the GSX main market, that issuer can take that prospectus with no further approval and happily and merrily go visiting 29 other countries. 
um, which is really efficient. That's the single market, which we're probably about to drop out of, but that's a really efficient way of raising capital. All you do is you tell our regulator, can you please let Italy, France, Spain, Germany, UK, blah, tell them that we're coming. Um, and there's a couple of tweaks to that, but it's a really efficient way of, of doing things. So the regulator in country has to be pretty comfortable that what they're approving um, is is uh, meets the regulatory objectives of the, of the of the prospectus directive. So our regulator, um, as you imagine, has always been you know uh, cautious about approving uh, tokenized security under the prospectus directive because guess what? You turn up in Holland uh, and a Dutch regulator may say, "What the hell is this?" So when you have Barfin the most conservative regulator in Europe, or at least one of the most conservative regulators, approve a tokenized bond offer to the public, that got our attention. So we, we, um, I'd met the Bitbond guys at a bond conference actually about a couple of months ago, and we just got talking. I said, you, how on earth did you pull that one off? And they said, look, Barfin had been amazing. And this was a real, it's a real big breakthrough for Europe because you've got the German regulators saying, you know what, we're going to approve this and you can take this prospectus to any country. And that's why for us, getting Bitbond into GSX uh, and getting um, working closely with Bitbond, we just thought it was a fantastic collaboration because it, it goes both ways and it's given us confidence and also our regulated confidence also that there are other regulators who are big, bigger and more conservative than you approving this stuff. So therefore, you can have confidence that what if you're going to approve a tokenized security for passporting, you're not going to get into trouble. Because this thing is, it's happening so quickly that Barfin even are approving things. And that's why this is such an awesome time. So that's the uh, the Bitbond collaboration. We just think this is this is a breakthrough breakthrough thing for for uh, for what's happening. So um so we think that's excellent. Um, in terms of segmentation, look, I think there's a couple of things to talk about. I think when we look at our um, our clients, we've got we kind of got three clients. We've got issuers, um, we've got investors, and also we've got member firms who um, who are the bridge between issuers and investors. Now we always are engaged with issuers here as an exchange, but in terms of who do we see, um, who do we see in terms of the next, let's say, couple of years? Uh, uh, issuing tokenized securities, I guess, number one. Um, I would say our sweet spot because of who we are and our size is probably, I mean, I'd love to say Facebook, but, you know, but I want to move to Hollywood and become an actor and that hasn't happened yet. So uh, I think, I think um, uh, the um, sort of 10 to 50 buck range of issuer, what we call SMEs, small to medium enterprise, is probably our sweet spot where we would see in terms of corporate issuers uh, doing um, equity and debt issuance, um, because of Juno, we see tokenized funds. We have a big pipeline building for tokenized funds. I think that's going to be really exciting for, for fund managers. Um, so I think in terms of issuers, that's our sweet spot. Um, but obviously, we would love, as this becomes more mainstream, and hopefully GSX is you know an early mover and a thought leader in this field, we would love for that to be higher profile clients. But equally, we know we know where we stand in the world rankings. So I think that's that's one thing. I think in terms of investors, you know, we want to try to bring on, first of all, your you know, your typical sort of member firms, your broker dealers, particularly in the UK and Europe, who again, we think that they can provide number one, their issuers access to a really exciting market that can reduce their cost of capital, but also they can provide their investors with access to trading securities. But equally, as a broker dealer, slash their back office costs through all of the stuff we've talked about earlier. So, um, the the irony of this is we've built a protocol that is being um, uh, marketed by our technology company. The reality is, in three years' time, the Gibraltar Stock Exchange could be the smallest exchange on the protocol that we built. And you know what? That's totally fine. I would love us to be the biggest. At the same time, you know, we recognise that Gibraltar is a is a small jurisdiction, but at the same time, you know, we're we're very prepared to be aggressive in our ambitions and our objectives. So, but very much the uh, your factory in Manchester looking for twenty million pounds is a classic type of organisation that we would love to work with and help. So, 
that's a um, that's kind of an insight into what we're thinking. Those are great insights, Nick. It's helpful to understand how you're thinking about these opportunities and the role GSX aims to play within the ecosystem. Last question for Gibraltar Stock Exchange and the GSX Group: What does the rest of 2019 look like for your firm and the industry as a whole? I know you've got some important milestones coming up. Maybe we can talk a little bit about those and how you're seeing the industry play out over the rest of this next year. Yeah, I think for, for us, I mean, our own objectives are we we want to get licensed to have our trading venue. Um, there is no trading venue that trades tokenized securities on a regulated exchange today. I don't think I'm being um, remiss by saying that. So we, we want our trading license um, and we are working, you know, um, with our regulator. We filed our application uh, back in April and that it, for us is the big breakthrough where if we can launch, list and trade tokenized equities, tokenized debt and tokenized fund tokens, doing what I said earlier, that we automatically update the registered book of members um, for the beneficial legal ownership. That that's a game changer. And I think that would become super, super exciting. Um, the second phase for us would then be to tokenize stuff, as I call it, um, where we could take, you know, Apple, Google, uh, Amazon, a building, a Picasso. And I think that starts to become quite interesting for fractional ownership stuff that starts to open up um, liquidity and capital to um, maybe private equity, family offices, Asset owners, there's some, there's some good things there which I can imagine happening in 2020. But for us, our real key objective is to press ahead with getting the trading venue up and running. So that's number one. Um, I think the way we see the um, the I guess the the environment evolving is to differing degrees. Um, the exchanges that we know um, who are friends. We're all going through the same analysis and process. Um, exchanges, investment banks, asset managers. Um, you know, I, I very rarely meet people who say my regulatory costs are going down and my margins are going up. Uh, most people say the reverse. So, you know, most people in financial services are, are looking for ways to increase their efficiency. And you know, I think a lot of us believe um, Jamie Dimon might not like Bitcoin, but he will be. The first to say that DLT can probably provide efficiency within JP Morgan. So that's that that conversation is happening everywhere. Uh, I think what will happen in 2020 is you'll start to see exchanges like us, uh, the Gibraltar Stock Exchange, exchanges in Asia, uh, exchanges in Europe. You will see exchanges start to turn on their tokenized security offering. And I think there is, as I said earlier, there is a big difference to providing a venue where a tokenized form of Apple trades, because as you probably know, you know what an ADR is, an American depository receipt. What you're doing there is you're taking in Apple ordinary stock, you're putting in something called a depository, and then you're just issuing a wrapper against it. That's exciting. Uh, that's good. You can buy Apple now with Bitcoin. Um, but guess what? The actual underlying shares haven't really changed. What is the big thing is when your token is actually the share, not a representation of the share. And that's where you're going to see, I think, in 2020, that breakthrough happen. And then that will accelerate then as exchanges, CSDs, registrars, paying agents, financial institutions start to think, okay, we need to get our we need to get our act together here because this is happening really quickly on our watch and there are efficiencies and revenue producing opportunities that we, we've got to exploit and get involved in. So uh, I see very much the, you, you think about a quacking duck, you know, there's not a lot going on on the surface, but underneath they're paddling like, um, paddling like hell. That's what a lot of these uh, institutions are, are doing. Everyone's working hard to, uh, to deploy this within their organization. So the next 12 months, you're going to see some major breakthrough, I believe. Nick, I've really enjoyed this conversation. You have some Really interesting takes on both the regulatory and technological sides of these issues. That's helpful to understand, being that you're actually building a lot of this infrastructure. I'll be following Gibraltar and your work at GSX closely. Thanks for taking the time to join me on Security Token Stories. Derek, thanks so much. And thanks for indulging me. And thanks for giving me the, the platform to tell you a little bit about our, um, about our organization and what we're doing here in Gibraltar. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
That's it for this week's episode of Security Token Stories. For more Security Token content, visit us online at securitytokenacademy.com and subscribe to our newsletter, The Security Token Edge, which lands in your mailbox each weekend. You can also keep up with the latest security token news by following us on Twitter, Telegram, YouTube, Facebook, and Medium. Before we go, a big thank you to Security Token Academy's Platinum and Gold Corporate members who make this podcast possible. You can learn more about Security Token Academy's corporate members at securitytokenacademy.com. I'm Derek Edward Schloss. From all of us here at Security Token Academy, thanks for listening. Security Token Academy does not provide investment or legal advice. We are not a registered broker-dealer or investment advisor. Opinions expressed in this podcast are the speaker's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of Security Token Academy. More information can be found on our website at securitytokenacademy.com.